Hi, in this lecture I'm going to be looking at uh, the functionalist sociological theory um, for uh, year 13. Um, this is um, uh, copied straight from the AQA spec, so you get an idea of what you need to be able to discuss, know, analyse and use examples for when it comes to functionalism and the other theoretical perspectives as well. And I've highlighted in red the elements that relate to this particular lecture. So you must know the difference between consensus and conflict theories, as including sort of functionalism and the new right, which I'm going to be covering in this lecture, um, as well as the other conflict theories, Marxism, feminism. <clears throat> you need to know, know the major variants within the theories. Um, in this case, we'll be looking at some of the neo-functionalist critique of functionalism. Um, uh, we're going to be looking at um, Durkheim, Parsons and Merton. Uh, you need to know the difference between structural theories such as functionalism and Marxism and action theories, which you'll have looked at in previous lectures, hopefully. Um, so let's get started. Um, so before we kind of get into this lecture fully, it's worth just trying to remember um, what you can recall about functionalism itself. It's a theory that we've come back to several times over the past couple of years. Um, it's a theory that you'll have looked at in quite a lot of detail across the different topics that you studied. Um, so just test yourself with these simple questions. Firstly, what is a consensus? What does it mean when we have a consensus? Um, secondly, what do we all need to have in order for society to work from a functionalist point of view? Um, how do we all get this? So the answer is number two. How do we actually get it? What's the key process? Um, this one might be a bit more challenging. Society has some basic needs in order to survive or work. What are those basic needs? And finally, hopefully you'll remember this one, what actually is the organic analogy, sometimes the biological analogy? So what can you recall about those five key questions? So when we think about functionalism, um, Durkheim, I guess, is the most famous functionalist. He's considered one of the earliest functionists. Um, and we've looked at his ideas, like I said, throughout the entire course. He argued that you could understand how society functions by comparing it with the functioning of the human body. Um, but it was Parsons who really developed this idea, and he is one who really kind of tried to apply it to how society works. And he became very, very popular in the early part of the 20th century, particularly in America, um, leading to functionalism becoming one of the most dominant theories in sociology at that time. Um, how is society like the human body? This is um, according to Parsons. So he talked about these three different areas. He said, um, it, uh, society is like a human body because of system organisms. So he compared organs to social institutions. Um, our, he argued that society is a social system of institutions, education and family, religion, work, and individual roles. So, you know, for example, mine might be mother, teacher, friend, daughter. Um, and all of these institutions and roles are self-regulating and interrelated, just like in the human body, all organs are self-regulating, but they're also interrelated with each other. Okay. Um, he also talked about um, functions, um, just like uh, in the body, uh, there are different parts that have to function um, to help the rest of the body survive. It's exactly the same within society. Uh, so, for example, we have the social institution of the economy that helps maintain society by meeting the needs for food and shelter because it provides employment, it, it provides wages uh, and the economy actually produces the goods that we need for those material needs to be met, for example. Um, and he also pointed out that each social institution is dependent on the others to work well. Just like if an organ fails in the body, the whole body can start to fail. So if a social institution stops functioning, the rest of society falters. Uh, so imagine, like, if the economy stopped working, um, you society probably wouldn't stop straight away, but gradually, over weeks, possibly months, um, society would start to dysfunction on a quite a serious level perhaps think like, if we didn't have sources of employment we didn't have income people couldn't pay, pay their mortgages they couldn't provide shelter you're quite likely to see crime increase because people can't meet those material needs um, people wouldn't be paying taxes so there'll be no money for education you know that's kind of what he talks about in terms of interdependence of functionality between uh, the different um, organs in the human body slash social institutions in society and finally he said you know Society is just like 
the body because it has need. It's got system needs, like the way the body needs oxygen in order to survive or water or food. Society has uh, needs as well. Um, so he, he was very big into shared values. He said that's a key need for, for, the, for society because it prevents conflict, helps everyone move in the same direction. Uh, we've also got material needs such as shelter, like housing. Um, these are all things that are very important in order for society to survive. Um, so I just want to go into a bit more depth about Parsons' analysis of the value consensus and how we achieve social order through the value consensus. Um, he said it was key uh, to society functioning and meeting its needs or goals. And he argued that the key processes for the value consensus to be maintained and therefore social order would be two processes you're very similar, familiar with, uh, socialisation and social control. So uh, what I've done is I've, I've used the example of the need um, for material needs uh, in this uh, slide, uh, but there are other examples of, of, of values that we all share or needs that we all have. So, for example, you could do the same analysis, but say um, we society needs families, for example. We need people to reproduce, uh, you know, we need the family. Or you could use, uh, for example, we need safety, we need security, and you could have that as an example and do the same analysis. But in this case, I've used material needs. So in order for everyone to behave in a way that helps meet the material needs of society, such as food, shelter, leisure activities, it's important that we all share certain values um, to achieve that. So we are socialised, if you like, to value um, work or hard work, and we also uh, value money. Now, this will sound familiar. This is meritocracy. We are socialised uh, through the family, predominantly in education, and then later on the workplace to, to, to value hard work because we know it will get us our rewards at the end. So we get these values through all the different agents of socialisation. It doesn't stop when you leave school. Um, it carries on. You know, The media reinforces those values, um, religion to an extent, uh, the workplace. Um, you know, We're constantly being re-socialised into these values. Um, so our values then set the norms of how to achieve these needs. So if values are what we find important and valuable, then norms are our behaviours, then what's normal. Okay. So what behaviours, uh, if you like, is, is normal in terms of achieving, achieving material success? So what is a normal way or what's normal behaviour for becoming materially successful? So you're probably going to start by thinking, well, you know, you're going to work hard at school. You're going to study hard for your exams. You might go on to university or get a good job. You might work really, really hard in that job and get promotions and you might get a pay rise each year. And you'll use that way to kind of access that reward, of financial reward to meet your material needs, which benefits society as a whole. Now, what's important to think about here is, what happens when people deviate from these norms? And um, you'll have looked at this if you study crime and deviant. So what happens when people perhaps uh, deviate from the normal way of gaining material success? Um, so you might want to think about Merton's analysis here with the innovator. Um, how do people react when they see crime take place, for example? Um, so if you see people or you find out about people avoiding paying their taxes or stealing cars or um, drug dealing uh, for material reward. We, we, we treat those people uh, well, we, quite negatively, uh, we can be quite hostile to them. The media will demonise such people. Um, so we will punish people who do not conform to our norms of uh, how to behave in order to achieve the value of uh, material success. Um, and so that's all social control, if you think about it. Our negative reaction to people who deviate from the norms is the way society uses social control to make sure everyone conforms. So I don't know, everyone in your community thinking, oh gosh, look at that scumbag who, I don't know, robbed that old lady. Um, that puts a lot of pressure on that person, that makes them feel awful, but it also reminds us, hey, we don't want to be like that person because look at how everyone's treating them. We definitely shouldn't go around robbing old ladies. Um, so... Parsons was very clear. We need social control as well as socialisation to make sure that everyone conforms to the value consensus. Um, it is worth noting here that Durkheim, who obviously wrote prior to um, Parsons, he was quite concerned about how modernity, um, and for him modernity was very much industrial revolution, the rise of science, um, mass economic production, factory style production. 
He was actually concerned about how modernity was starting to undermine the collective conscience uh, slightly, um, or the value consensus. And he started to see this sort of rise of the individualism, um, uh, so the individual becoming perhaps more important than the community or the collective. Um, so for him, he said, look, society must regulate individuals to maintain social order because otherwise people are going to go off in completely opposite directions to one another. They're not going to share the same goals and society will break down. Um, so for him, he did see the growth of individualism, but he argued, actually, don't worry, society is powerful enough through our agents of social control to keep everybody striving for similar needs and goals. So Parsons talked about um, f the, the four key needs of society, um, which I mentioned earlier on, one of those key questions for you to think about. Um, he said um, adaptation was one of them, uh, where the social system meets the material needs of members, which I've already talked to you about. So, you know, make sure society provides employment, um, uh, make sure uh, the government ensures there's enough housing being built, you know, those sorts of things to make sure that we have the material needs being met. Uh, the other thing that society needs to function is shared goal attainment. We need everybody kind of aiming um, for the same goals. Um, and he argued the political system was one of the main aspects of society that does this and makes sure that we all aim, you know, to get jobs, to get houses, to do well in education, to live safe lives, to avoid crime, to report crime. All of those kind of things, all those shared goals allow us all to kind of get along with each other. And it is, it's a good point because if you think about, I'm sure some of you have experienced it when you're sat in a classroom and maybe one or two people don't really share the same value of educational success. What happens when their behaviour gets in the way of everyone else in the room? Um, it, you know, the whole entire class can sometimes grind, grind to a halt and that's dysfunctional. Um, so it's really important if you think about the, take that kind of what's going on in the classroom analysis to the whole of society if you get groups of people going against the grain going against the shared goals that can create huge social problems and can actually mean society stops functioning the way a class might stop functioning if one or two it, children weren't behaving very well um integration was another key part of uh, function of society sorry not function integration was another key aspect of society needed to function um, this is the idea that we all need to have a sense of collective identity, social solidarity, and he argued the key parts of society to do that are things like education, religion, arguably less religion these days, and perhaps more things like media helps us feel integrated. Um, and finally, this idea of latency, or what's known as pattern maintenance. Okay, so latency, pattern maintenance, is about keeping things the same or very similar, okay? So making sure people behave in the same or similar ways over and over again. Um, and this keeps society stable because it means that we're all socialised into similar roles uh, that we'll keep on fulfilling. So, you know, you might be socialised um, into, you know, I'm going to go and be a good worker and then you might be socialised into becoming a parent when you're a bit older. It's really important that all of us do get socialised to fulfil those roles according to functionalism. Otherwise, you know, we might not bother getting jobs or we might not bother have starting families. So that helps society keep on going according to Parsons. Um, I just want to talk to you a little bit about that, the functionalist view on social change because it's quite a useful area to contrast with the conflict theories. So functionalists argue that, yes, social change does happen, but it happens really gradually. So they're not a massive fan of rapid social change, but they do believe it's important. Uh, so they look at social change or society change as happening really gradually, just like evolution within the organism. So a little bit back to that organic analogy, like over time, bodies, humans, organisms adapt to their surroundings but it happens uh, so slowly we can barely see it uh, so we know this from crime and deviance uh, Durkheim argued that um, crime was functional because it helped us identify uh, the need for social change so if you were getting a huge number of um, I don't know burglaries for example way above what we're usually expecting then you might look at that and go oh, hang on oh, it must mean there's not enough employment for people or education systems not working we need to change something in other aspects of society um, I'm sure you've looked at examples like oh, you know um the suffragettes, for example, they're, they're a good one to look at. They were all seen as criminal, deviant, they were arrested. Um, but now we actually look back at them and think, oh, you know what, they were trying to achieve equality for women, that's completely normal. But at the time, they, they, they were vilified by the media, but they were important because they identified a need for social change in society. 
Um, another aspect of change he talks about is um, this a process known as structural differentiation as societies modernised. So he argued that we are sort of shifting away from traditional kinship systems, particularly the family, but also possibly the church. So in kinship systems, um, like big fam we might have lived near or with big family groups. They would have probably determined the jobs we did, the parties we voted for in the elections, uh, the views we held on ranges of issues, and we probably wouldn't have moved very far from them. Um, so our ideas, beliefs, our behaviours would have been very similar to that social group. But in a modern society, we don't generally live like that anymore. Uh, and he said, look, as these traditional systems decline, other systems will take over those roles in terms of their socialisation and social control. So who or what takes over? Um, I would argue perhaps um, the media would be a good example um, of perhaps giving us, socialising us into shared norms and values, um, maybe even politics, um, political parties might take more of a role. Um, you know, there's a, and maybe the workplace, the education system, all these different institutions perhaps have taken some of that functionality away from traditional kinship systems. Um, the final point I want to talk to you about here is dynamic equilibrium. So this is, um, I'm thinking about the organic analogy here. He talks about how when something changes in one part of society, it can lead to an adjustment in another okay and it's very much a balancing act okay so think of it like a seesaw or as I've got a picture of a bunch of rocks balancing um so when something changed in one institution and I've given you the example here of the 2007 or 8 recession so that's obviously the economy and the economy is a good one to look at because when things happen in the economy over time things tend to change elsewhere so that recession the impact it had on families was well many of them stopped having so many children because there wasn't so much financial security there weren't guaranteed jobs for the next two three four five years um, and we might see something very similar happening uh, sort of after uh, the possible uh, recession linked to COVID-19 people are talking about this possible baby boom but actually what's more likely is people are sat at home who might have been planning to have a family thinking oh I might not have a job or my my job security isn't there anymore. So I'm not going to try and have a family because I I'm not going to be able to support them. Um, and then we can link that to the impact the postmodern economy is having on the family unit, where the postmodern economy needs people to move around the globe. It needs people to work remotely. It means people to be really flexible. And you know what? We don't actually need as many workers in the postmodern economy because lots of people can work on computers, we can use machines. So actually we're getting less and less people having lots and lots of children. So arguably families are getting much smaller, they're getting mobile, and we're getting a lot more single person households as well because we don't necessarily need a big family unit anymore for the economy. And that's an example of dynamic equilibrium. So in the theory um, section, and if you get a theory essay, whether it's 10 or 20, marks um they aqa do want students to be able to talk about the different opinions within each theoretical perspective um so merton is a considered a neo-functionalist um he's a, a more modern functionalist and he is somewhat critical of traditional functionalism from both um people like Comte, durkheim and parsons um <clears throat> and here he sort of makes three criticisms of parsons like he he doesn't see society as a as a well-oiled smooth running system the way Parsons, Durkheim and what have you would have seen. So he talked about this idea, he critiqued this idea of indispens about, indispensability. Um, Merton said that actually not all institutions are in, in, indispensable. Um, so for example he said the, the nuclear family and religion, uh, Parsons argued that you know those were the, the, the best types of um, institution to provide things like socialisation, social control, for example. And he said, you know what? He, he, Merton argued that we could use something what's called a functional alternative. So he actually said, look, lone parent families, LPFs, can provide exactly the same types of functions for children, for example, as perhaps a nuclear family. And in that sense, traditional functionalism needs to be a little bit more flexible in its um, ideas about what institutions should or shouldn't look like. Um, Pars, uh, Merton also critiqued this idea of functional unity. So remember earlier on I said 
that um, uh, when it came to the analysis of the, the society being like a human body, and Parsons believed that every single part of the human body was integrated, um, so if something happened in one uh, part of society, it would affect the another part of society. Um, Merton argued that actually in a modern society, and let's take it a step further, even a postmodern society, societies are far too complex for this. And actually many aspects of society are not connected to other areas uh, and they have what's called a functional autonomy or independence from others. Um, so a good example here is if you change the stru structure of banking or the rules that guide banking, that's unlikely to affect the rules of rugby. So there are clearly areas of society that are not going to affect one another. Um, obviously, when you talk about big social uh, areas of society, like the economy as a whole, um, that probably will affect quite a few areas of society. Um, but yeah, not, not all aspects of society are not connected to every other aspect of society. And this final one is one I'm particularly interested in, because um, it sounds almost a bit Marxist. And this is what I like about Merton. I think he can be quite critical of the functional perspective. So he critiqued this idea of universal functionalism and Parsons assumed that everything in society has a positive function for anyone. It's universally great for everyone. But Merton said, um, no, that's not the case. Um, yes, some aspects can be functional for some people and some groups of society, but can be really dysfunctional for others. So think about what you know about education. Education, uh, uh, the education system is functional for certain groups in society particularly the middle classes um you know but it's they're quite dysfunctional for others so quite often um you know that the working classes don't uh, succeed as much during in education because they perhaps feel that education isn't for them um education dominated by a set of middle class norms and values so they don't feel that they can access it um but society doesn't correct itself. This dynamic equilibrium hasn't happened. We've had inequality in education. We've had inequality in, in families. We've had inequality in healthcare uh, for hundreds of years in this society. But society hasn't corrected itself. That dynamic equilibrium hasn't kicked in. Um, if anything, there's been quite a lot of resistance to reforms to make them all more equal, if you like, or a bit more fair. Um, so... Merton calls this negative function and he suggests that some groups may have the power to actually prevent reform okay um, as the current system actually really suits them. Um, now Merton is a functionalist but this idea of negative function um, and the idea that there's a certain group preventing change that does sound quite a lot like you know conflict theory like Marxism or feminism perhaps so that's a really useful evaluation to remember if you can't remember anything else about Merton and his critique of functionalism try and remember that point for number three because that's quite a useful one because then you can use that to create a chain of reasoning into a point on Marxism maybe um I just want to nip through super quick um, some of the different criticisms uh, from outside of functionalism. Okay, and they're sort of divided into four sections in the textbook, so I've summarised them here. Um, firstly, you get the logical criticisms. Um, this is the idea that functionalism sees all institutions existing because of their effects. So they believe that the family, an institution, exists because of the effect of socialisation. Um, but it doesn't actually explain why it existed in the first place. Like you, you sort of have to have something existing before uh, for its effects to happen, if you like. But functionalism just says, yeah, the family exists because of socialization, but it doesn't explain why, for example, the first families would have been formed. Um, it's also full of contradictions. So when it looks at deviance or crime, functionalism argues that deviance is both functional because it helps with social change, but they also argue that it's significantly dysfunctional for society as well. So it's full of contradictions. Um, you're probably going to be able to get most of your criticisms of functionalism from the conflict perspective, so that's going to be your Marxism and your feminism. Uh, so functionalism doesn't allow for rapid social change, and it really struggles to explain it when it does occur. Uh, so it doesn't allow for any sort of revolutionary change, for example. Um, 
they ignore that actually society is based on significant amounts of conflict in the sense that certain groups do dominate and do well and um, at the expense or the exploitation of other social groups. And there's this idea that this value consensus isn't really a consensus. These shared values we all have, they actually suit certain groups in society. And if you're a Marxist, that's the ruling class, you know, the people who kind of hold the economic purse strings. We value hard work for financial reward because they want us to. Um, or if you're uh, from a feminist point of view, we actually end up sharing these sort of quite patriarchal values about what's normal in society and what's important, whether that's the value for family, which actually ends up exploiting women predominantly because they end up doing the bulk of the housework and the child rearing. Um, or you've got the ideas of Kingsley Davies, who said that um, prostitution, for example, was functional for the family. Um, because it was an outlet for the husband's sexual desires and stopped them running off with a secretary and having an affair. So it's better that they use prostitutes. Now, feminists are fairly critical of that idea because it ignores the exploitation of the woman in terms of the, as a prostitute, um, but it also ignores the kind of harm, the exploitation and the cruelty to the kind of the women and children in the home as well. Action perspectives, they say that, you know, it's far too deterministic. There's no room for free individual will. Functionalism really does prioritise the social, the society above the individual. Um, action theories say, actually, you know what? Um, individuals actually construct society through the interactions with others. This society doesn't exist above us. Society doesn't control us. We actually create the social world around us through repeating behaviour, through... Um, it, adjusting meanings for example and that's quite a complex process that can't be analysed from a macro perspective and then finally postmodernism is a good theory to use to criticise um, functionalism so they argue that functionalism overstates uh, the amount of order and stability in a very diverse society uh, so things like that have led to diversity is multiculturalism um, globalisation for example um, they're also really critical of any theory that tries to explain one society. So they're critical of any meta-narrative, whether that's functionalism, Marxism, feminism. They say that one theory cannot explain the entire complexity of society. And finally, just that point about value consensus, which is a good one to make because it critiques kind of uh, Parsons well, is that they say that there's no way we all share the same values anymore in society. Um, we have far too many groups living in one, in one country. We've got different sources of values from the media. There's no way that we're all sharing the same value consensus. However, interestingly, our society still seems to function or we still all manage to get along without murdering each other. So there's something more to it. The functionists haven't quite got it right when it comes to the value consensus, according to postmodernists. So I just want to talk to you quickly about functionalism and their approach to research methods. If you've looked at the Durkheim study of suicide topics, some of this would be quite familiar. So functionalism is a truly modernist theory. It was established during the Enlightenment period in history, which some of you might have looked at in history, sort of looking at your sort of 18th century period of time, 18th, 19th century. Um, and they, they believe that we can still discover true knowledge and use it to make society better. That's kind of the aim of the Enlightenment period, which was a scientific movement, by the way. So uh, functionists favour scientific research methods because that was, if you like, the prevailing school of thought during the Enlightenment period. They wanted to establish themselves as a, as a, a respected science, so they used the methodologies applied to studying the natural world. They also prefer scientific research because they want to establish social facts or social laws through studying uh, society scientifically. So you're looking for your objective research methods here, your official statistics, your questionnaires with um, closed responses, uh, your structured interviews. Um, so you're looking for your most objective data sources you can get. Um, <clears throat> So a social law uh, might be uh, inadequate socialisation makes crime more likely. And to est establish that, you might look at the social backgrounds of some of the people in jail. You might say, oh, look, 40% um, of them went through the foster care system or were adopted. Uh, that suggests inadequate socialisation. Therefore, I'm going to create the social law that's inadequate socialisation makes crime more likely. And then we've got the, um, the rule from Durkheim's study of suicide there. A lack of social integration makes suicide more likely. And he, uh, for example, compared the Catholics and Protestants in Ireland that which we'll look in Europe that we'll look at in a second. Um, 
if you are going to make a point about functionalism and research methods, it really is good to talk about Durkheim's study of, use of suicide. It is a functionalist classic. It is a positivist classic. So from your research methods, it's a positivist classic study. So he used official statistics on suicide from Western Europe, which is a positivist research method because it's um, data, secondary data. And he found clear patterns in suicide with some countries being higher than others. So UK and Germany had much higher suicide levels than Ireland and Italy at the time of Durkheim's study. And he believed that he'd established a correlation between, well, he said it was integration and he linked it very much to religion and suicide. He argued Catholic countries like Italy and Ireland were much less likely to commit suicide, where there was Protestant countries like the UK and Germany more likely to commit suicide. And he, one of the reasons he explained this was that he found that Catholic communities were far more integrated with one another. Uh, within Catholic communities, um, there's a lot more social pressure to go to worship. You have to go to confession. Um, whereas within the Protestant faith, you don't actually need to go to church to be absolved of your sins. You can pray privately, for example, so people don't need to go to church so often. Um, and within the Protestant faith, people had lower church attendance, so less integrated into wider society. Um, so that's a useful study um, to kind of demonstrate how you can look at official statistics, find a pattern and establish a social cause or a social fact. Um, however, of course, you need to AO3 or evaluate Durkheim's research. So um, official statistics on crime or any actual area quite often are socially constructed. And for, in the case of suicide, there's an argument from interpretivists that they reflect the opinions or views held by society. In this case, a coroner. So a coroner is someone who decides or determines the cause of death by looking at all the evidence. They don't actually cut open the bodies and have a look at themselves. They look at all the evidence that's collected by others. And a coroner is a human, and they're going to be influenced by their ideas of whether it's what is a typical suicide. So that can be things like, oh, what was the method? Um, did they leave a suicide note? Were they taking drugs beforehand? And so coroners, as they build up their own ideas of what's a typical suicide, are more likely to make those value-laden judgments, if you like. So if they see someone who, I don't know, used to take heroin and has been found hanging, um, they might say, right, yeah, that's very likely a suicide. OK, but if they come across, I don't know, a mother of two kids happily married in a in a car accident that could have been intentional, they might go, oh, no, she looked like she was quite happy. I'm very I doubt much doubt that's a suicide and they won't rule it as a suicide. And that's very value laden because it's coming coming from their own opinion, if you like. Um, there's also um, a critique of Durkheim himself uh, of imposing his own values on the research. So the fact that he selected suicide was a value laden choice. Because he want, he took a very individual act and he wanted to prove it had a social cause. So his values were there, if you like. He wasn't being that objective in the choice of his topic. Um, but probably a better point to make, really, um, is actually he discounted certain variables himself. So he discounted the weather for no apparent reason. And he also, this is always the one that makes me laugh, um, and I always remember this one a little bit better. Apologies for the spelling here. Um, he believed... Uh, that women, or argued that women were less likely to commit suicide because of pet own, own ownership, particularly cats. Um, now, that is a, very much a gender stereotype, that women are less likely to kill themselves because they've got cats and that makes them happy. Um, so that's a good example to remember if, if you can. Uh, and finally, he was Eurocentric. He only examined European data and record keeping at that time was pretty uh, questionable. Obviously, it wasn't um, uh, kept on any sort of... Uh, computerized database at the time because obviously the technology wasn't there. So this is just a, a quick revision act activity you might want to complete um, that I normally would do in class. Um, so divide a sheet of paper into four and try and answer these four questions. Um, and that kind of gives you quite a good plan if you did get an essay about functionalism, like you know, examine the usefulness of functionalism, functionalism. Um, is functionalism relevant in contemporary society? Uh, so what is good about it? How is it useful? Um, so, you know, the fact they can explain prostitution is useful using James E. Davis that I mentioned earlier on. Uh, what are the key concepts associated with functionalism? So if you get a 10 marker on functionalism, quite often it is something outlined and explained two concepts associated with functionalism or um, sort of linking about num number three, outline and explain um, to criticism of functionalism. Um, number three, what are the main problems with the functionalist perspective? So arguably they, they've got rose-tinted glasses, they, they only look at the positives, what conflicts are they ignoring in society? 
They see the nuclear family has been great. What sort of problems go on behind closed doors? I've already mentioned to you what the, what the feminists reckon. So kind of husbands going off and using prostitutes as a, as a positive, like perhaps we could use that criticism. And finally, there's that section about how to functionist research society. And that will link to the fact that it's a structural macro theory. Um, you could obviously get a question on the new right as a theoretical perspective. Um, I would say it's unlikely to come up as a 20 mark standalone question, but you could get a question on functionalism and the new right as a 20 mark question, for example. Um, so when it comes to the new right, I always think about it as functionalist sort of grumpy younger brother. Um, it's much more conservative than functionalism, um, very much in favour of the status quo, so keeping everything the same. <clears throat> And they're critical of pretty much anything that might threaten this. So they, um, anything that might threaten this, so um, that could be uh, rapid economic change, that could be significant changes in the family, uh, shift, rapid shifts in norms and values. Yeah, so they really want to keep things much more the same and, and, and stable. It's also considered, um, sorry about spelling again, uh, a political ideology. And it has a, as it has a very clear idea about the ideal society and how it should operate. So that's why the new right is also considered an ideology. Um, so one of their key institutions is the family. Um, so this is different to functionalism because functionalism would say that all as institutions are equally important, whereas a new right really do place a lot of emphasis on the role of the family. They believe the family should be responsible for the economic well-being of its members and provide care where necessary. So they're not a fan of people going on to benefits, as you know, um, they're not a fan of people maybe perhaps going into the care system when actually family members should be looking after them. And there's been quite a few policies over the past, gosh, best part of almost 20 years, it feels like, um, where really the, the conservative governments have seemed to have favoured families. Um, so here I've got some examples from David Cameron. So he um, uh, unveiled a scheme that would stop childless 18 to 21 year olds from housing benefit and remove their entitlement to job seeker allowance after six months after failing to find a job and this would be because he would want them to kind of look, live with their own families he want their families to care for them um, or give them shelter it's not the state's responsibility um, the new right also argues that the nuclear family is the best model uh, it said because you get a balance of role models male and female you get Discipline, particularly important for um, arguably boys in school, um, according to Charles Murray. And he, uh, they argue that the fam nuclear family is the most economically stable model. Um, and this was reflected in social policy when David Cameron introduced tax breaks for married couples so they can get a tax rebate if they're married. If there's no nuclear family... Uh, and then you right argues that would mean inadequate socialisation and that could have consequences for educational failure, crime and the economy. So one of the most predominant points about the, the new right is it's very much anti-welfare state. They don't see a solution to our social problems as giving more money to the poor. Um, they don't want to invest more in healthcare. They don't want to increase benefits. Uh, and when it comes to crime prevention, as some of you will know, um, they don't want to uh, kind of maybe think about reducing marginalisation and those complex social processes, they would rather deal with things like, you know, strict punishments um, and making crime more difficult to occur. So they believe the government should interfere in people's lives and they favour sort of neoliberal social and economic policy that's very much hands off um, social and economic policy. Let the, the market determine um, which businesses should succeed and fail, for example. Here are some of your key thinkers. But again, lots of you will know. Charles Murray, um, he discusses the underclass, this idea that there's a social group, um, quite an offensive term, I think, for that social group, the underclass, who um, perhaps are living uh, in con on benefit support. Their parents have never worked. Their children have never worked. Um, they're likely to come from broken families. Uh, very little value for meritocracy. More likely to engage in delinquency and have poor educational achievement. So he is very critical and concerned about the growth of the underclass, both in the UK and America. At Chubb and Moe, you're all familiar with, from the marketization of education, they argued that if you can create, make our ed, the public, sorry, if you can make the state education system behave 
as if it's operating in the in the private sector so financially motivated then you're going to get a much more efficient education system so it gets schools to compete for students bums on seats gets schools to compete with one another through league tables and then arguably you're going to get much higher standards um, and you've got Margaret Thatcher, who obviously wasn't a sociologist. She was a conservative leader and she was prime minister. Uh, she was very much um, into the privatisation of the public sector. Uh, getting uh, the st She didn't want the state running the electricity, the gas, uh, the phone service, the national rail. She wanted it all to be privatised and she did. She sold all of those services off. So if you think about anything that's got British at the beginning of it that used to be run by the state. So BT, British Telecom, British Gas... Um, National Rail, um, these are all institutions that used to be run by the government, uh, British Airways, um, but are now run by the private sector. So she sold them all off into the private sector and arguably they um, now operate more efficiently, according to the new right, because they're dominated by market economics and they aren't propped up by the state. Uh, and then finally, Wilson and Kelling, um, which you'll know from right realism within the Crime and Deviant Unit, with the argument that offenders make rational choices to offend, so we need to kind of introduce serious consequences that outweigh the potential rewards. That's very much linked to this kind of idea that um, it's not the state's responsibility to kind of prevent people commit crimes. It is uh, an individual's responsibility if they commit crime and they need to kind of be punished harshly if they do commit a crime. OK, um, so that's kind of just a very quick nip through the new right as well, just to kind of support you in any if any questions like that came up at all. Thanks for listening. Bye.